Hello, welcome to this uh, session of uh, TCT Asia Pacific. My name is uh, Javier Escanet, and I have the pleasure of uh, being today with my co chair, uh, Dr. Myung Ki Hong. We have a fantastic uh, session today dedicated to imaging and physiology, a block of lectures by distinguished uh, uh, speakers. And I'm going to hand it now to uh, my co chair, Dr. Hong, who will be introducing the first uh, block of lectures. Okay, uh, we have uh, the uh, four panelists, uh, Dr. An from the uh, Asan Medical Center, Dr. Ali in the, the uh, United States, and uh, Dr. Fuji from uh, the uh, Japan, and uh, Dr. Onuma. And the first session is uh, the advance in the physiology indices. The first topic is uh, the angiography derived coronary uh, physiology will be present uh, Dr. Fionon from the, the uh, Stanford University. Dr. Fionon, please. Thank you, uh, um, Dr. Hong and Dr. Um, Eskenad for uh, the invitation. It's an honor to present at TCT AP 2021. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. I'd like to start off by talking about why don't we perform wire-based coronary physiology more often? And I think there are a number of reasons uh, it takes time. There's issues with the wires and handling characteristics. Pressure drift can be frustrating. Uh, side effects of adenosine, if we uh, are using hyperemic indices, uh, it can be expensive. And there is a small risk to putting a wire into a patient's vessel. And if you look at all of these uh, reasons, they're all related to having to use a coronary pressure wire. And so it raises the question of whether we could derive this information without the wire and without adenosine. And based on information obtained from the angiogram alone, could we get the same uh, information uh, as we do when we put a pressure wire in a patient? And in the United States, there are now uh, three uh, FDA approved techniques for doing this. There's FFR Angio from CathWorks, uh, QFR from Metis Medical, and VFFR from Pi Medical. And they all uh, do it slightly differently uh, than each other, um, but I'll show some data. Uh, this is um, a study from uh, Bozu uh, uh, looking at quantitative flow ratio or QFR in over 300 lesions compared to wire-based uh, invasive FFR. And you see there's a very nice correlation with a sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy all above 90%. Um, VFFR or vessel fractional flow reserve was also recently compared with wire-based uh, FFR in 100 patients and also had a good correlation and an AUC that was 0.93. Uh, we performed the FAST FFR trial, which was a multi-center study in uh, the U.S. and Europe um, comparing FFR angio uh, from CathWorks with wire-based FFR in over 300 vessels. And you see that the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, again, was all over 90%. So suggesting that these techniques are quite accurate and um, might be able to replace uh, wire-based techniques. Um, FFR Angio is the one that I have the most experience with, so I thought I would just spend a minute talking about how it works. Um, basically, the coronary arterial network is modeled as an electrical circuit and with each segment acting as a resistor. Then the vessel resistance is estimated based on its length and diameter. And each vessel's contribution to flow is based on its impact on overall resistance depending on this arrangement. And from uh, this, you can uh, estimate the, um, the flow in the setting of a stenosis and compare it to the flow in the theoretical absence and calculate FFR. I thought I would just show two cases. These were early on in our experience. And so we not only did the angio derived FFR, but we also did pressure wire derived um, to correlate because we were still learning. Um, this is an elderly, uh, typical American patient, five feet, five inches tall, 271 pounds, who had uh, aortic stenosis and coronary disease. And about a year and a half ago, we, uh, or before this um, case, uh, we did a TAVR and PCI of her LAD. And at that time, she had a moderate uh, obtuse marginal branch lesion that had an FFR of 0.82, and so we deferred. But 
uh, 18 months later, she came in with a lot of atypical chest pain. She had a normal uh, LV function and her mean gradient was 16 uh, millimeters of mercury and she didn't have any paravalvular leak. She also underwent a stress echo and had no wall motion abnormalities. But uh, because of her um, recurring symptoms, we finally brought her back to the lab and also because we had placed that LED stent. Um, the LED looked fine. The stent is there in the mid segment. Um, and this was that obtuse marginal branch lesion that we had FFR'd a year and a half prior, and it was 0.82. She also had some disease in the posterior descending branch of her right coronary, as you see there in the sort of proximal to mid segment. So just to walk you through, the, the current CathWorks system is even more automated than this. It, it actually selects the three images for the vessel that you're interested in. In this case, it was the obtuse marginal branch. And um, then you need to uh, basically put the little plus sign on the lesion and mark the ostium of the coronary. And then it'll now automatically uh, trace the coronary vessels and basically um, create um, a stenosis measurement. Now you, you can um, adjust this if you need to, but typically it's quite good and you don't need to adjust it. And I try not to, uh, to avoid any manipulation. Uh, in this case, that obtuse marginal branch, the FFR angio was 0.88. And like I said, this was early in our experience. So we did a wire-based uh, method and it was 0.83 as well. So we felt reassured. We also checked the right coronary or the PDA and the FFR angio was 0.86, and then the wire based was 0.81. So we deferred intervention. These correlated with her negative stress echo, and uh, we treated her medically. This is another interesting case, 77-year-old man with hypertension and dyslipidemia, and he uh, presented to his local physician with pretty classic exertional angina. He had a coronary calcium score that had been performed previously and was quite high in the 90th percentile. He underwent a myocardial perfusion scan and it didn't actually show any ischemia, but because his symptoms were pretty classic and persistent, despite medical therapy, he was referred for an angiogram. And you'll see that uh, the LAD is not too impressive. There is calcif calcification and some mild to moderate mid LAD disease. Um, this circumflex gives off kind of an inferior obtuse marginal branch and it had a more impressive looking, although it's a small vessel uh, lesion in it. And so in this case, we did the angio derived FFR of the CERC and, or OM and it was 0.90 and the wire was 0.94. So we left that alone. Uh, interestingly, the LAD, despite the fact that it didn't look that severe, had a very low FFR angio. And when we did a wire based, it was 0.64. So in this case, we went ahead and treated that LAD. So what's next? Um, well, uh, Zubo and colleagues uh, are, have uh, been performing the FAVOR-3 trial in China, looking at QFR-guided uh, angi angiographic strategy for PCI to um, an angio-guided strategy. And a year ago, finished enrollment uh, amazingly quickly of 3,800 3, patients. And so we look forward to um, the results of this trial uh, in addition, uh, this was an interesting study that was just recently published looking at using uh, angio-derived um, techniques to measure microvascular resistance, or IMR, um, estimating flow with the Timmy frame count and making assumptions for hyperemia, and then estimating distal pressure using angiographic-derived techniques. And here they measured IMR with a wire and compared it to the angio-derived IMR and showed a very uh, reasonable correlation. So we may see techniques uh, soon that allow us to not only measure epicardial vessel, but also uh, microcirculation. So I think um, the key next steps will be generating more and more clinical data, validating um, these uh, techniques in real world setting uh, and against clinical outcomes. And that I think will reassure us that um, eventually uh, these techniques can replace uh, wire-based uh, physiology. Thank you for your attention. Next presentation is uh, the uh, role of uh, the quantitative flow or ratio in the guided PCI. The presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Zubo uh, from the, uh, China. 
Dr. Zubo, please. It's a pleasure honor to uh, be invited to the uh, TCTAP meeting. I'm honored to present this uh, uh, role of QFR in guiding PCI. It's my disclosure. Uh, actually, after uh, Bill's presentation, I just want to discuss the clinical outcome uh, regarding uh, QFR-based uh, PCI in, uh, intervention. As we all know, computed coronary physiology index, uh, for example, QFR currently well validated against the wire-based FFR as the reference standard. Uh, moreover, I think it's simplicity, shorter assessment time, fewer complications and lower costs may further promote the use of physiology guided decisions in the catheterization laboratories. This is a typical working flow of QFR. And uh, we already showed this uh, uh, excellent diagnostic performance of such kind of angi angiography based uh, FFR technology. And so uh, what about the pre-PCI assessment? As we know, two publications in Jack Intervention and Circ Intervention discussing the QFR-based uh, functional syntax score. Uh, uh, as uh, we, you can see, functional uh, QFR-based functional syntax score was calculated by summing the individual scores only in vessel with low vessel QFR and ignoring a lesion with vessel uh, QFR greater than 0.8. So first, uh, after calculating the functional syntax score, we found 16% of the study patient moved from high risk group to lower risk group. And this uh, re-classification uh, can uh, further uh, improve the uh, discrimination from uh, risk of MACE uh, than uh, classical syntax score. Uh, how about the strategy selection? Uh, we found 6% of the patient for whom cabbage may be recommended by syntax score can convert to a lower risk group and therefore another treatment option, PCI, may be preferred. You can see this uh, uh, blue bar, the favor PCI group, the even rate not changed, but however, this uh, favor cabbage group was changed. What about this uh, procedural guidance? We uh, defined the P uh, QFR based precise treatment, PT, uh, means patient in whom all uh, physiological significant ischemia vessels were treated by PCI and uh, in whom all vessels with QFR greater than 0.8 were deferred. Otherwise, uh, they were termed to have QFR based imprecise treatment. According to our uh, retrospective analysis we found from an all comers trial, only 58.5% uh, 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 of patients had real QFR-based process treatment. Uh, however, on the other hand, of more than 40% of patients had imprecise treatment if we don't use FFR in the procedure, before the procedure. So obviously the uh, achievement of QFR process treatment was associated with uh, the improved two-year clinical outcome and both on, uh, on the adjusted uh, IPTW analysis. Uh, in the sensitivity analysis, uh, we found uh, PT was associated, uh, compared with uh, on the treatment, uh, precise treatment can reduce the even rate, but however, compared with the oral treatment will be small sample size. We cannot see this uh, statistically significant uh, difference. Uh, however, the use utility of the medical device can be uh, reduced uh, during the procedure. Uh, what about this uh, intermediate coronary lesion? We evaluate uh, 820 in a patient with uh, almost 1,000 intermediate angiographically intermediate coronary lesions. Uh, it appears safe to defer treatment of vessel with a functionally insignificant intermediate lesion if at the baseline, the QFR grids and open A and during long-term follow-up. But importantly, we define a delta QFR, which is the 
any uh, change on baseline uh, QFR and uh, follow-up QFR. So you can see this is a real uh, useful tool to annually eva evaluate dynamic functional change of the four intermediate lesions. So compare with the Delta QFR uh, lower than 0.03, and then the, if the patient with a Delta QFR greater than 0.03, the five-year VOC was much higher in this group. Uh, uh, I think a post-PCI assessment is a hot topic. Two publications in 2019. And uh, in all, our own data also further confirm this finding, although uh, this uh, uh, very similar you uh, see, uh, and uh, the best cutoff value is 0.92 according to our data. And uh, you can see this is a, a, a significant difference between this uh, post PCR QFR less than 0.92 or greater than uh, 0.92. So, we propose a new index. This uh, uh, actually is a pre-PCI uh, simulated residual QFR, uh, correspondence to the QFR value if a pre segment of the assessed vessel is uh, completely dilated, which is essentially predictor of actually post-PCI QFR. This is a two picture, show you the pre-procedure and post-procedure uh, uh, QFR. This is simulate. Uh, 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 actually, we can show excellent uh, agreement uh, between this uh, simulated residual QFR and the post PCI QFR. Uh, finally, we evaluate uh, 1,782 vessels with available uh, simulated residual QFR. We found this. Uh, uh, vessels with suboptimal, if suboptimal residual QFR means uh, less than 0 0.92, uh, can suffer worse uh, two-year VOCE, uh, not only VOCE, but also each individual component. So finally, uh, as uh, Bill just mentioned, uh, Fever 3 is uh, an investigator-initiated multicenter and subjects a clinical assessor blended randomized trial. Uh, the important step is a prior randomization. All this uh, subject, uh, all the uh, physician must identify the vessels intended to treat, and then the subject can be randomized one to one to QIFR guided strategy versus angiography guided strategy. The primary endpoint was one year maze. Uh, defines composite or cortex, MI, and uh, ischemia driven revascularization, and also have an important major secondary point, which is also powered the one year mass ex excluding uh, paraprocedural MI. So I think uh, as the largest uh, uh, randomized control trial of the physiology guidance for revascular resection, Fever 3 China uh, has com completed its uh, enrollment also. The one-year follow-up, uh, this study aims to effectively identify the ischemia lesion that uh, uh, had the real intervention value and can improve the long-term prognosis of patient so as to formulate a reasonable treatment strategy. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank Bill and uh, uh, Javier and all my uh, international advisors and we are hoping to present a present, uh, primary result at TCT this year. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, very excellent presentation with a lot of the, uh, strong data. The final presentation is that the invasive physiology in ACS patient. Can we believe it? Uh, we'll be present uh, Dr. Lee uh, from uh, Samsung Medical Center. Dr. Lee, please. Thank you very much, Professor Hong. Uh, today, I'll be talking about invasive physiology in ACS patient. Uh, can we believe it? So these are my disclosure. As you well know, the domain of invasive physiologic assessment is either for epicardial coronary stenosis or microcirculation or both. The pressure-derived indices such as FFR or non-hyperemic pressure ratios 
is used for evaluating epicardial coronary stenosis, and IMR and HMR is used for the microcirculation. Let's start with the invasive physiological assessment in the culprit vessel first. This recent study well demonstrated the impact of acute microvascular dysfunction in STEMI patient to the culprit vessel FFR in comparison of paired FFR value between acute phase and six months later, FFR value was significantly decreased in the presence of microvascular obstruction in cardiac MR. However, in patients without no MVO, there was no significant changes in culprit vessel FFR. This result suggests that FFR in the culprit vessel underestimate the region severity in the presence of significant microvascular dysfunction. Another study evaluated non-STEMI patient. In this study, FFR was measured in the culprit vessel and the stenosis with FFR over 0.75 was deferred. During the three years of follow-up, the deferred non-STEMI patient showed much higher event rate than stable patient. This result implied the caution is needed to defer culprit stenosis based on FFR in the setting of acute non-STEMI. Conversely, there are many solid evidence which support the microcirculatory function is more important in culprit vessel territory. These previous studies will demonstrate that IMR is well correlated with the infarct size and microvascular obstruction and is also independent predictor of death or rehospitalization in STEMI patient. So in summary, the culprit region requires revascularization based on the clear prognostic benefit over medical treatment. So evaluation of culprit stenosis using physiologic index is inherently limited. However, microcirculatory dysfunction in culprit vessel territory is more important in acute MI patient. And the IMR is the independent prognosy indicator in STEMI patient. Let's move on to the invasive physiology in non culprit vessel evaluation. Since about half of acute MI patients have non culprit vessel stenosis, so it is very important uh, of accurate physiologic evaluation for the non culprit vessel stenosis. Nevertheless, there has been concern about reliability of non culprit vessel FFR in STEMI patients. In this small study, Doppler measured CFR, resting, and hyperemic coronary flow velocity were compared among culprit vessel and non culprit vessel and the control patient with stable angina. In comparison of hyperemic coronary flow velocity, non culprit vessel showed decreased hyperemic flow velocity than stable patient. The authors claimed blunted hyperemic response in STEM setting and possible underestimation of non culprit vessel stenosis by acute phase FFR. However, in actual patient data, which compared acute and follow-up non culprit FFR values, there was no significant changes between two paired FFR values. And the impact of culprit vessel microcirculatory dysfunction to the non culprit vessel FFR was evaluated by preclinical study. In this experiment, the significant microvascular damage was induced by lipid microsphere injection through the LAD. With the lipid microsphere injection, the IMR was significantly increased, and along with the increased IMR, the FFR was also increased. However, in the non culprit vessel without microsphere injection, there was no changes in both FFR and IMR. So from this result, uh, microcirculatory dysfunction in the culprit vessel is a regional problem and did not affect non culprit vessel territory. So FFR in the non culprit vessel may be reliable even in the acute phase. And furthermore, when we compare the changes of non culprit vessel FFR, which was measured just after primary PCI during acute stage, uh, uh, when we compare those non culprit vessel FFR with the stable patient, there was no significant changes in those trends between MI and stable patient. So this results support even in the acute stage of MI, non-culprit vessel FFR can be reliable. Recently, 
two representative trials provide solid evidence of non-FFR-guided non-culprit vessel PCI in STEMI patient. Dynamic 3 pre-multi compares staged FFR-guided non-culprit vessel PCI with the culprit-only PCI group and compare acute compared mostly immediate non-culprit vessel PCI guided by FFR versus culprit-only PCI group. In both trials, FFR-guided staged or simultaneous non-culprit vessel PCI showed prognostic benefit than culprit-only PCI group. Currently, PCI for the significant non-culprit vessel stenosis defined by angiographic stenosis severity from complete trial and this physiologic stenosis severity, uh, which means FFR below 0.80, is supported by multiple randomized controlled trials. And the current guidelines support the use of FFR to evaluate non culpit vessel stenosis, even in the acute phase of myocardial infarction. Before moving to the next subject, I'd like to discuss more, uh, more about recent papers about prognosis of deferred non culprit vessel based on FFR. Dr. S. Kanet compared the prognosis between ACS and stable patient from patient level pooled data of three registry and two RCT data. In the treated group, there was no difference in clinical event between ACS and stable patient. However, in the deferred group, ACS patient with deferred non culprit vessel stenosis showed a higher event rate than stable patient. Based on these results, the authors mentioned about safety of FFI guided deferral of non culprit vessel should be re evaluated. However, when we compare between ACS versus stable angina patient, according to the range of non culprit vessel FFR, ACS patient with deferred non culprit stenosis consistently showed higher event rate than stable patient, regardless of FFR value in non culprit vessel. We can find the possible explanations from imaging studies. These representative studies uh, consistently show that ACS patient had higher incidence of vulnerable plaque in non culprit vessel and those vulnerable plaques were significantly associated with a higher event rate than stable patient. Considering this result, the higher risk of clinical event of ACS patient is not a matter of reliability or cutoff value of FFR. It is just because the inherent patient characteristics, just like diabetes, CKD, or peripheral vascular disease. Let's move on to the last topic about which index can be used to evaluate non culprit vessel stenosis. This study compared acute versus one, uh, one month follow values of FFR and IFR in non culprit vessel of STEMI patient. In paired comparison, FFR in non culprit vessel showed significant changes uh, between acute and follow up phase. However, their IFR was not different between acute and follow-up period. However, it should be noted that IFR in the non culprit vessel showed much lower correlation coefficient than FFR between acute and follow-up values. ISTEMI study evaluated 120 STEMI patients with paired IFR value in non culprit vessel and as you can see, a non culprit vessel IFR showed a significant increase about uh, after acute phase. More importantly, the classification agreement between acute and follow-up non culprit vessel FFR was only 78%. This result clearly showed that IFR in non culprit vessel during acute stage significantly overestimates stenosis severity. This preclinical study evaluated CDL changes of resting and hyperemic indices in non culprit vessel. Uh, and those physiologic indices were serially measured before occlusion of culprit vessel, during occlusion of culprit vessel, and after reperfusion of culprit vessels. Compared with the baseline phase, balloon occlusion of circumflex induced significant changes in coronary flow velocity pressure gradient, and microvascular resistance. However, resting in this rem uh, after repopulation of circumflex, hyperemic index recovered its baseline value, 
However, resting index remained to be changed and never recovered baseline resting values. As a result, FFR was similar with the baseline status. However, IFR remained to be significantly lower even after the refusion. So this study clearly showed that resting index can overestimate region severity during acute phase of myocardial infarction. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my final slide. Can we believe invasive physiology in ACS? I think, yes, we can. Some additional consideration is needed about clinical presentation, target vessel, type of index, and timing of measurement. This table summarizes our previous discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, it's time to have uh, the discussion time about the uh, three, the uh, physiology presentation. Any comment or question about the uh, three presentation? I have a uh, question to the Dr. Jubo or the uh, Dr. Uh, William Ferron. So the, uh, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. The, actually, QFR data is very fantastic compared with the uh, uh, pressure wire FFR. Then previously, the, uh, it was well demonstrated that the coronary angiogram was very inaccurate to predict the FFR. Then what is a major technical improvement in QFR or angiographic based FFR to predict FFR? So the simple diameter synopsis, uh, accuracy rate to predict the FFR is uh, around the 60%, but the QFR is uh, more than 90%. What is the major improvement to our technical side? Yeah, um, I can start off and then Zubo can um, add to this. I think uh, the main um, advantage of these newer techniques, particularly like speaking for FFR Angio is that um, the system creates a three-dimensional reconstruction of the vessel based on orthogonal angles. And that alone is better than the two-dimensional QCA, but then also the different algorithms that are used to um, estimate the flow or pressure drop across the stenosis, um, I think further um, you know, improve the accuracy. And so those are the main uh, modifications compared to just based on QCA diameter stenosis. Yeah, I uh, completely agree with Dr. Farron also. Uh, the three companies are using different uh, algorithm, but uh, I, I think uh, the principle is uh, similar. And uh, even using this uh, simple tool in the cast resistant laboratory, we can, if we can just uh, spend two minutes then improve clinical outcome, would be amazing. That's uh, that's my thought. So, uh, Bill, can I ask you a question uh, and Jubo as well? So, I, I want to play devil's advocate just for a second, being the director of a angiographic core lab. So, most of the QFR and angio FFR studies, their comparison for diameter stenosis is fifty percent, but we don't really use fifty percent other than to determine whether there's a lesion. We mm. usually don't start stenting until we get to seventy percent. Mm. So. What, why don't we, um, to the best of my knowledge, we do not have a direct comparison of QCA percent diameter stenosis at 70 or even higher compared to uh, a, a QFR. Yeah. How, what, what's your thought about that? Yeah. Uh, 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 may I first respond to this question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, according to our CFDA policy, uh, our study, the Fever 2 China, was designed as the primary uh, outcome was uh, accuracy of this uh, uh, online uh, QFR when using FFR as a reference standard, but not 50% uh, of diameter stenosis in, uh, by angiography. So I agree with you, 60% diameter stenosis may be a more reliable standard uh, for future e evaluation. But although we confirm this uh, uh, angiographic uh, FFR is uh, useful uh, in the validation study, we still need the outcome data. Until outcome data is available, then we can see this is a, this is a solution. 
Yeah, I think that's a very good answer. I would just add that, you know, well, first of all, I guess QCA, um, you know, isn't, at least in the United States, regularly used, um, you know, on a routine basis in the cath lab. So that's one limitation. And if you think about just eyeball angiography, obviously there's a lot more variability compared to QCA, but when those, either of those techniques are compared to wire-based FFR, um, you know, they get, as you mentioned, uh, maybe 60 or 70% uh, concordance. And so I think it's just, again, a limitation of, uh, you know, trying to recreate um, from a two-dimensional image, you know, the, the three-dimensional structure and, and just basing it on QCA or eyeball angiography is inadequate. May I ask um, um, Dr. Jo Myung Lee, because we are talking, of course, of QCA. QFR has been used mainly in the context of um, stable coronary artery disease, with exception, of course, of looking to non-culprit lesions. There's been, uh, and I think that intuitively many people feel that uh, QFR can be very useful once that you've done uh, the, prim the, the culprit uh, lesion in STEMI to assess non-culprit lesions. So, uh, Jo Myung, what is your view about the value of QFR for assessment of uh, non-culprit stenosis, particularly from the perspective that you have highlighted of shifting boundary conditions uh, in acute coronary syndromes that may influence measurements in the non-culprit lesions? Yeah, yes, Javier, that, that's a nice question. Uh, and may, maybe in my perspective, non free vessel evaluation using angio drive the FFR uh, it is quite accurate because the already there are many publications which evaluated non free vessel QFR or angio FFR uh, on the comparison with the invasive actual FFR value and those diagnostic accuracy is mostly over eighty percent or eighty five percent and in Usually, non curvy vessels microvascular saturation is not affected uh, from curvy vessel territory. So, I think the non curvy vessel angio FFR may, may be very accurate. However, when the patient is under cardiogenic shock or very low blood pressure, that angio FFR may, be, may overestimate region severity than actual invasive FFR value. However, we should consider invasive FFR was not also validated in that hemodynamic derangement circumstance. Thank you. Actually, the uh, 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 angio-derived uh, physiology um, assessment is uh, quite uh, uh, fantastic, uh, particularly in the real clinical practice. Uh, I, I agree. And uh, particularly in the Dr. Fioron and the Subo presented uh, 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 quite a nice presentation with uh, the huge number of the, the data. And if it is uh, really reliable and practical, it's time to the change the, the, our practice pattern in the everyday practice. What I mean is uh, from the, the wire-based uh, uh, physiology to the, the uh, NGO uh, derived physiology assessment. Let me ask the uh, uh, two uh, presenters, what is the, the percentage of the NGO uh, derived uh, the physiology assessment in real practice? What percentage without the use of the real uh, pressure wire? If you are really confident of the, your data, why, why, why do we use uh, the uh, pressure wire here? wire-based uh, physiology assessment. What is the, the percentage? What is the default? Uh, in, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, in our country, the use utility of uh, wire-based uh, physiology is low, uh, around 2% uh, countryside. Uh, in my hospital, I think less than 3%. Uh, when we uh, initiate this uh, angiography-based uh, technology in the CAS lab, it, uh, we can see the penetration was uh, increased gradually, especially uh, after the outcome data uh, or outcome publication was available. And uh, we can use uh, this uh, uh, tech in uh, 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 patient selection Vessel selection also now we can use it and post the PCI. So uh, right now the penetration is uh, 
around 15 to 20 percent in my hospital, but still very low. <laughs> Yeah, I think in the United States, um, the angio-derived FFR techniques still haven't really taken off as much as you'd expect. Um, you know, wire-based, I think, is around 20% or so, um, depending on the center, and um, but uh, angio is much lower. And I, I think part of the reason is because um, people are waiting for more outcome data to be honest. I mean, I think the correlations with wire-based is very reassuring, but, you know, I think people wonder whether these are, you know, cases that are cherry picked or, you know, you know, done at select sites and whether it's really real world. And I think um, people really like to see outcome data, um, you know, showing that there's uh, equivalence or non-inferiority. And so that's my sense of why it hasn't really taken off in the United States yet. Another Bill, can I ask you, uh, sorry, uh, Javier, I was going to ask both Bill and Jubo about, so, you know, I recently reviewed this literature when I was preparing a talk. And one thing that I noticed that there was in a lot of exclusion criteria in the trials. So patients with poor ventricular function, uh, patients with significant valvular disease. So, you know, that's part of what's interesting about, um, wire-based physiology is that it allows us to do things that are unique in the cath lab. For example, to assess viability, to assess, you know, moderate stenosis in patients with heart failure. This is something that we do all the time. Uh, where are we with testing that large subset of patients um, that is a big part of our practice that we really haven't well evaluated at the moment? Well, um, there are registries being, I mean, as you know, being established in the United States to look at um, angio-derived uh, FFR techniques um, that will hopefully include a much broader patient population. So I, I think you're exactly right, you know, that, and that's probably part of the reason why the technique hasn't taken off as much as we'd hope. I, think uh, I also think uh, the... Uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria uh, for favorite flavors, not too many. So let's see what happened. A question to the uh, uh, Dr. Shubo. I think uh, the post-procedure uh, QFR uh, is uh, quite interesting and it has some potential to buy the PCI. Uh, in your presentation, you uh, presented the cutoff of 0 0.89 from the uh, Hawkeye, 91 from the Syntax2, and new uh, data shows that 0 0.92 for the cutoff for the, to predict the, or to avoid the future event after procedure. So, uh, but um, um, in your experience, uh, you have an online QFR in cath lab. How frequently do you use the uh, post QFR value to guide or optimize uh, uh, PCI? Results. Thank you, uh, Yoshi. Uh, actually, we have such kind of uh, research idea from your group, and uh, uh, we uh, as analysis. We do analysis from the Panda Three retrospectively. So, in our daily practice, uh, I think uh, only ten percent of the uh, real world cases we we did uh, uh, post PCI QFR. And obviously, one of the great uh, potentials of, uh, of the QFR and imaging, uh, functional imaging, is that you can perform a very sophisticated um, prediction or analysis or planning of your PCI strategy with the aim of um, not having residual disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the question to uh, Shubo and to all the colleagues and panelists also is. Uh, to what extent do um, you believe that um, the possibility of optimization is, uh, is adequate? I'm thinking st studies like, for example, target FFR that has demonstrated that um, sometimes it's very difficult actually to amend what you see and what you know that is functionally significant after PCI. Okay, there is a no question or comment. Uh, uh, let's move to the, the next session, the imaging session.
Dr. S. Kanada, please introduce uh, the, the uh, topic. Thank you, and Thank you Dr. Hong. So we move now to another uh, block of sessions, very exciting with the title, uh, Imaging Talks About the Vessel. And um, again, I remind you that we have with us as panelists, uh, Jung Myung An, Ziada Lee, Kinichi Fuji, and, and Yoshinobu Onuma. Now the first uh, lecturer in this, um, in this uh, section is uh, Takashi Kubo. And the title of the lecture is Imaging Detection of Vulnerable Plaques at High Risk of Developing ACS. Uh, thank you, uh, Takashi. My, uh, my presentation title is Imaging Detection of Vulnerable Plaques. So several imaging techniques have shown the potential ability to detect the vulnerable plaques. The main target of the imaging is thin cap fiber toma uh, with large lipid necrotic core, thin fibrous cap of less than 65 micron, and a positive uh, and a large plug button. And our uh, first VH iris, a uh, prospective uh, prospect study used the VH iris to predict uh, future mace. And uh, this study uh, demonstrated the combination of VH TICFER plus plug burden more than 16% plus minimum lumen area less than four. It was highly associated with a future event. A uh, positive predictive value was 18%. Angioscopy. So previous angioscopy study have demonstrated a patient with multiple yellow plugs had a higher risk of follow-up ACS even than those without multiple yellow plugs. CT, a low attenuation plug. Low attenuation plug is defined by a less than 30 hands field unit. The uh, patient demonstrating positive vessel remodeling with low attenuation plaques on CD and geography uh, were at a higher risk for follow up ACS segment when compared with patients having lesions without these characteristics. MRI high intensity plaque in a non contrast T1 weighted image. So this hip is highly associated with uh, the. Uh, the, the risk of their uh, future cardiac leak events. Recently, we can use NEAR, and NEARS uh, can identify the lipid core block in coli artery. And an LRP study. LRP study used a binary cut off value of maximum LCBI more than 400. And this study demonstrated NEARS IGRS uh, can identify. Uh, both patient and a non carpet coin plaques at high risk for future events. Uh, recently, a uh, prospect two study uh, was uh, reported, and this study used the cut of, of max LCBI4 more than 324.7, and this study uh, uh, concluded. And use identified lipid rich and geographically non pro limiting plaques and that were responsible for the future coin events. Also, uh, this study demonstrated uh, the combination of the lipid rich plaque and large uh, plaque burden identified the vulnerable plaque that placed patients at especially high risk for future miss. Now, OCT. OCT uh, has, uh, has an ability to identify important uh, characteristics of coronary atherosclerosis. And an MGH registry, uh, this registry was conducted by Dr. Aki Chan. Uh, this uh, is a patient level analysis. And this uh, in, uh, MGH registry interested in the lipid rich plaque a lipid rich plaque was defined lipid arc more than 90 degree. And uh, the, result, uh, the result was patient with uh, lipid rich plaque in non culprit region of the PCI targeted vessel showed significantly high risk of future maze compared to those without lipid rich plaque. 
this is a Klima study. Uh, this uh, study was conducted by Dr. Uh, Palati from Europe, from Italy. Uh, this is also patient level analysis. Uh, this study investigated the simultaneous presence of minimum lumen area less than 3.5, fibrous gap thickness less than 75 micron, lipid arc more than 180 degree, and macrophages accumulation. And this study demonstrated a patient with these four plaque features in proximal LAD showed significantly higher incidence of subsequent acute chronic event compared to patient without these four plaque features. And then more recently, a combined OCT FFR study was reported. And this is a, a plaque level analysis uh, in diabetes, uh, diabetes patients. The patients with TICFA had a significant increase in target region related mace as compared to patients without TICFA. Uh, we also performed a plaque level analysis using OCT registry. Uh, we performed the OCT in 1,378 patients and we, we found a 3,533 plus. And uh, uh, we followed up median six years. And uh, uh, finally, we found 72 ACS uh, arising from uh, Conway plugs imaged by baseline OCT. Of course, we, uh, firstly, uh, we in, uh, investigated about the uh, lipid rich plug plus a tick fat. Lipid rich plug was defined a lipid arc more than 180 degree, thin cap fibrotoma was defined uh, of fibrous cap thickness of less than 65 micron. And this is a couple of my curves. Uh, lipid plaques that were characterized as both uh, lipid rich plaque and a tick fat had a significantly higher risk of follow up ACS uh, than lipid plaques that didn't have those characteristics. A more detailed analysis of both OCT predictors, univariate and a multivariate analysis demonstrated a max lipid arc, maximum of fibrous cap thickness, and a minimum lumen area were independent predictor of the future uh, ACS. Optimal cut of values. So max, maximum lipid arc more than 185 minimum fibrous cap thickness less than 150 micron, and minimum lumen area more than 2.9 square millimeter was the optimal cutoff to predict ACS. And the rate of ACS, uh, as shown in the light bar, uh, the combination of lipid arc more than 858 uh, plus fibrous cap thickness 150 micron plus minimum lumen area less than 2.9, it was associated with high, uh, higher risk of their uh, follow-up ACS events. The predict, uh, positive predictive value was 32%. The prevention, the plaque stabilization with PCS can inhibitor, uh, this is an arterial study. The addition of alilocumab was uh, associated with a significantly greater increase in the fibrous cap thickness and a significantly greater percentage decrease in lipid index and macrophages glade. And a, a prophylactic uh, PCI uh, for vulnerable plaque. This is a, a prospect absorb study. Uh, this study compared between uh, VBS versus uh, guideline directed and me and medical therapy alone. And then uh, PCI of angiographically mild stenosis and mild lesions with large plaque burden was associated with favorable long-term clinical outcomes. So conclusion, imaging can be used to identify both patients and non-carpet plaques at high risk for future events and should be considered for, the, for use in patients undergoing cardiac catheterization with possible PCI. And the studies uh, for the use of imaging guided therapy should be done to address and mitigate the high risk for MACE of these patients and the plaques. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kubo. I'm sure that uh, there will be a lot of discussion about your talk uh, once that we have uh, completed the block of, of lectures. Uh, we move now to the second uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Aiki Kang, uh, entitled uh, Imaging for Patients with Minoka, What We Can See. Dr. Kang. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Park, uh, for kind invitation, but he gave me a tough topic though. Uh, Minoka, what, what can we see? That's my disclosure. So quick epidemiology. Uh, about 5 to 6% of patients with uh, acute MI underlying mechanism is uh, Minoka. Minoka is more uh, frequently seen in women, up to 50%. Uh, interestingly, in women, uh, the prevalence of STEMI and non-STEMI are more or less the same. In men, STEMI is the predominant uh, presentation. Younger, age average, 58. And those pe people is less likely to present with uh, significant ECG changes. And typically, a troponin elevation is uh, in a smaller, mild, mild degree. Certainly, there is some genetic component. The black uh, people and people Maori, uh, there's the native New Zealanders and Pacific uh, and Hispanic people. They have higher incidence of Minoka. Traditional coronary risk factors are less frequent in this population. So what's the diagnostic criteria of Minoka? Uh, it's the myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. So it's a myocardial infarction. You have to have positive markers, plus clinical evidence of infarction, such as chest pain or sudden onset shortness of breath, EKG changes, and new loss of myocardium on scan or new regional warm motion abnormalities. When you should angio, intracoronary thrombus. And typically, Angiographic stenosis is less than 50%, and you have to rule out other clinically overt causes like sepsis, PE, or myocarditis. So there are three categories in Minoka. One is coronary causes, and the second is non-coronary causes with cardiac disorder, and third really has nothing to do with cardiac. So the focus should be coronary causes, which include plaque rupture or erosion and SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and rarely aortic dissection extending into the right coronary artery, and the coronary embolism, and microvascular disease and coronary spasm. I will come back to those two. Non-coronary causes of cardiac disorder, typically three. Takasubo, myocarditis, and cardiomyopathy. And non-coronary causes are usually obvious. Stroke, PE, sepsis, ARDS, and end-stage renal disease. So just one picture. Uh, this patient came in with acute MI. We didn't find anything. When we did OCT, surprisingly, there is a superficial disruption. So we, uh, this is a topic, although, quite confusing. Uh, our group has been interested in this particular topic over the past several years. So we um, look at recent studies and among those, I picked three most contemporary studies, Opalski, Garbo, and Raynor. And I will focus on these three studies. All these three studies, they use combination of OCT and CMR, cardiac MR. So try to compare those three um, small number, roughly 30, 40, and Reynolds uh, had higher number, but this is all women. It's a part of a women's heart attack research program. So they enrolled only female patients. So the aim of the study of Opalski from Poland was to assess plaques as a cause of Minoka. So they are focusing on epicardial plaques Garbo similar to evaluate diagnostic yield, but looking at ischemia. Renal to determine either vascular or myocardial process. So the aim of the studies are different. Enrollment eligibility is also different. 
although all three are amino acids, MI and GERBO more focus on ischemia, ischemic EKG changes or or motion abnormalities and suspected epicardial disease. Compared to those renal, women with MI, that's it. So the gender difference, as I mentioned, this is 100%. Look at the prevalence of STEMI. Opalski, Gerbo, 30%, 40%, whereas Raynaud, 3.5%. So although overall inclusion criteria is Minoka, it's very different population. So for OCT finding, it's too small, Opalski, only 10 patients. So let's focus on Gerbo and Raynaud. The Gerbo typical acute coronary syndrome etiology, plaque rupture, erosion, and calcified plaque, and some others. Compared to Gerbo, which showed typical OCT findings, rupture 5%, erosion 3%, intra-plaque cavity 21.4%, and layer plaque 13%. So does anybody know what intraplaque cavity is really? So I look at her uh, pictures. So let's just focus on these two, intraplaque cavity. When you see low signal deep into the vessel wall, that's what they call intraplaque cavity. There is no communication between this low density, low signal zone, with the lumen. Layer plaque, you see layers with different optical density. Again, no communication with lumen. Though nothing came into the lumen, they are all different OCT patterns inside the vessel wall. So we our interpretation is the association between intraplaque cavity and acute MI in the absence of plaque disruption or local thrombus has not been reported to my knowledge. And that they call as an etiology of MI. A layer plaque is a consequence. It is not the etiology of plaque destabilization. Plaque has disrupted mural thrombus, organized, collagen type three becomes one with deposition. It will become an organized layer thrombus, which layer become, later becomes integrated into the eccentric plaque. So it's a consequence of plaque disruption, not the etiology. And they thought layer plaque was the etiology of MI. So there, there is an interpretation uh, difference. And coronary plaque features such as these, in patients with, with Minoka do not prove causal relationship, but may simply be incidental findings. So it was published at least online in circulation. And very, you know, shortly after Garbaud's study, same patient population seems like, but they are not. Different patient population, different interpretation. How about CMR finding? Again, quite different. So what we are interested in is relationship between epicardial event and myocardial necrosis. So ischemic late gadolinium enhancement, 23%, 77, 53. So the, their conclusion, again, Opalski, too small, 10 patients. So we'll focus on Garbo and Reno. So OCT, they found abnormalities, not necessarily causal relationship in 35%, CMR 77. The combined, something happened in epicardial disease with subsequent myocardial damage, half of the patient, 57. Whereas Reno OCT, they found 46%, 46% include layered plaque, intraplaque cavity, okay? So when they see this, any abnormalities, they saw in 85%. So 
So conclusion of Polsky, plaque disruption and thrombus were very frequent. And those may be the etiology of ischemic injury and therefore OCT is valuable tool. Carbo, abnormal OCT or abnormal CMR, 100%. However, the combination which will establish causal relationship, abnormal OCT and in the same, ter same territory, abnormal CMR, only half of the patient. Raynor, abnormal OCT or CMR, abnormal CMR, 85%. Again, remember this includes all those layered plaque and um, intraplaque cavity. Management obviously is not a prospective study, but um, statin, ACE, ARB, significantly beneficial. Beta blocker, although did not reach the significant level, clearly 0.86. Interestingly, that showed no benefit Yet the guideline recommend in case of plaque disruption, that one year and single agent for lifetime. So it is very confusing, <coughs> but this is not a benign condition. This is a very ominous, serious condition. In hospital mortality, 1%, one year mortality, 4.7%, four year, 13%. A pretty serious condition and recurrent angina 10 to 25 percent and then four years free mi seven percent ischemic stroke four so whether this is that's a vascular problem or blood problem it's not that clear so this is my proposal <laughs> it is not guideline so it is very different from what, what guideline uh, showed. So troponin, you are dealing with MI, right? So troponin goes up and down. You have to discourse. And then angiographic diameter stenosis less than 50%. That's universal definition. And other overt clinical causes you, you can easily rule out, right? Then you have a working diagnosis of Minoka. Then you look at the LV function, echo LV gram, and Takasubo, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, you can more or less easily rule out. Then you have a diagnosis of Minoka. Then I recommend CMR and sometimes localized myocarditis. You, you don't see any clear regional or global one motion abnormality, but can be detected by CMR. OCT, plaque disruption, plaque rupture erosion, and sometimes SCAD is not that obvious on angiogram, which you can uh, pick up with OCT. And as I mentioned earlier in the, you know, the three category slide, chronic spasm and microvascular disease. So provocative test and vascular resistance, microvascular resistance tests such as the CMR or uh, CFR uh, will have a role to make a conclusive diagnosis of Minoka. So conclusion, very confusing, which is good. There is a lot of research opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kang. I'm sure that we will have a great discussion later on, on this very interesting presentation. Now let's move to the uh, final uh, lecture in this block uh, by Dr. Gary Mintz. And the title is uh, Intravascular Imaging Guided PCI and Universal Approach for Optimization of Stent Implantation. Uh, Gary, looking forward to your talk. So, earlier studies, including one by um, Takashi Kubo, who's on the panel, showed that there were significant differences between OCT and IVIS in terms of measurements and, of course, in terms mm -hmm. of um, resolution. But with the advent of high definition IVIS, the differences in measurements have become minimal and the resolution has improved a lot. Furthermore, both the IVIS and the OCT predictors of 
events after DS implantation are remarkably similar and are primarily stent under expansion and geographic miss. While the improved resolution of OCT, for example, in detecting malapposition in 50% by OCT compared to 14% by IVIS, have not translated into predictors of actual events. So we have evolved into a, a strategy or a philosophy that the two techniques can be used, if not interchangeably, at least in the same way. Now, clearly there are differences in terms of assessment of um, image interpretation and assessment of things such as calcification, but the OCT and the IVIS detection of calcification and the quantification in terms of ARC are almost identical. And we have published and now have impressed a second calcium scoring system. The calcium scoring system using OCT is based upon the angle, the thickness, and the length of the calcium. And the IVIS calcium scoring system that's impressed in CERC intervention is based on the length of calcium that's more than 270 degree arc, a calcified nodule, small vessel size, and the presence of a 360 degrees of calcium somewhere in the lesion. And this is our universal approach. We start with pre-PCI IVIS to assess calcified plaque and other complex morphology. And if there's superficial calcium, it's quantified by OCT or IVIS based upon the calcium scores. Then, if necessary, a plaque modification device such as rotational orbital atherectomy or um, shock wave, or perhaps in lesser degrees, cutting or scoring balloon is performed, followed by repeat imaging to determine whether or not a calcium fracture has been created by one of these devices. We then transition to stent sizing based upon the distal reference and post dilation based upon the proximal reference. And we then check to make sure that expansion has been optimized based upon the criteria that were um, selected and geographic miss was minimized as well as the absence of complications. In terms of data, although we do not have any randomized data from our group, there, is, there are now three studies that show that both IVIS and OCT can essentially give you the same outcomes. This is the randomized opinion study, again by Takashi Kubo, showing that event curves are superimposed out to 12 months. Then there was Bayesian met network meta-analysis, showing that IVIS and OCT had essentially the same event rates but that both were better than angiography. And then in STEMI patients from Korea, the CAMI registry showing that IVIS guided or OCT guided stenting in patients presenting with STEMI was superior to angiographic guidance. So we have predictive models that are similar. We can use them interchangeably in terms of sizing and um, landing zones for optimization and avoiding geographic miss. And we have outcomes data that's very similar with the two techniques. But I think it's also important to understand that sometimes imaging cannot overcome adverse biology. And I wanna share with you one case that has both IVIS and OCT throughout this gentleman's short and unfortunate course. He was 45 years old with risk factors and he had chronic renal failure on hemodialysis. There was a lesion in the proximal right. By IVIS imaging, long calcium, more than 270 degrees, circumferential calcium, and a calcified nodule. So his calcium score clearly predicted stent under expansion. And in fact, with post dilation with a 24 atmosphere balloon, granted um, plaque modification was not performed, you have a nice angiographic result but stent expansion of only 45%.
Two months later, he has recurrence and the calcified nodule is back inside the stent on the IVUS imaging. He had a drug coated balloon with OCT guidance, probably a little bit better result than initially achieved with IVUS guided and the initial stent implantation. Two months later back and is looking even worse and the calcified nodule is now occupying a good percentage of the stent. Restented with OCT guidance, beautiful result at this point, angiographically and by OCT. One month later, he's back again. So here is a situation in which neither technique was in fact helpful. In terms of when to use one or the other, most of the time we're looking at stent sizing and optimization. And in the vast majority of cases, IVUS and OCT are effectively interchangeable. Yes, there are situations where one has more data or is preferential. Assessing rupture plaque and thrombus, OCT is better. Left main disease, IVUS is better. Aorta lesions, IVUS is better. CTOs, probably IVUS is better. Instant restenosis, OCT is better. And a patient with impaired renal function, IVUS is, is better. But for garden variety, day in and day out, stent optimization, 80 to 90% of your PCI needs can be addressed with either IVIS or OCT. And unless you're in a very busy center, you should pick one and get good at it. And the other 10 to 20% of cases, and depending on your practice, for example, if you do a lot of left main, a lot of renal failure, a lot of CTOs, it is important to know which patient, which lesion, and which clinical scenario will be better suited to IVIS versus OCT assessment and guidance. But this represents the minority of cases, and you can really start to think about a strategy, a universal intravascular imaging guided strategy using either IVIS or OCT. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. This was a, an amazing uh, lecture. So, okay, so welcome now the time for discussion. I'm, I'm going to hand it actually to our panelists to have uh, their first uh, reaction regarding the three lectures that we, we had and we take it from there. So, uh, Ziad, what is your reaction to uh, what uh, has been shown in the three lectures? And, and let's start the discussion. I think you're muted, uh, Ziad. Thanks very much, Javier. So. I, I have to first of all apologize to IK because that talk is impossible. So I can only imagine how long it took you to put it together because it's a mess. And um, I was part of that, uh, the, the Reynolds study, and I had the exact same arguments you did. When I saw those OCTs, I said, well, how can something that's happening in the wall be connected to what's being in the lumen? But the overall consensus was in fact, I was the one who sort of pushed them to make probable, possible, and definite, um, because I agree with you. I'm, I'm certainly not convinced that those pathological findings on OCT correlate to a myocardial infarction and how they re relate enzymes. So my first reaction is, although I was hoping that the HARP study was going to provide great clarity into um, the pathophysiology of Minoka, I would say maybe I'm modestly more um, understanding, but I also am somewhat miffed how we're going to provide such resource utilization. How can you take a patient with no epicardial coronary disease, do an echo, do a cath, do physiology, do an MRI, and then still not come up with a diagnosis or more importantly, have a treatment plan? So. I, I think that, you know, that's how I'd like to open it up and see what the others have to feel about this. Clearly, IK showed beautifully that this is of major clinical significance, but I'm not sure we're quite the wiser yet on how to manage or treat it. Um, Siad, if I can just jump in, I've always been, in my, my mind, you know, this 50% this 
stenosis or less seems to me to be a bit misleading because some of these are angiographically normal and some of these are just the angiogram is misleading rather than being normal. And I'm not so sure we should be lumping these together that a 50% lesion is the same as a vessel that looks almost pristine in a patient who presents with an infarction. So that's a good point, Gary. Actually, the reviewer for the paper asked us exactly that question. So we, right before we um, published the paper, we actually spent two weeks going through the whole thing all over again and separating out all the completely normal vessels because as you say, those are normal and the people who have atherosclerotic disease are not normal and it could just be a missed event. Uh, Dr. Fuji, do you have any comments uh, regarding uh, this topic and also, you know, the, the, the role of OCT in patients that have Minoka, et cetera? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So the, I think the user, usefulness of the using IVIS and OCT, they have been debated for over a decade. And for the first, but the, first of all, for example, like 10, 10 years ago, it was things like, so for example, I can see that I think a fibrotrauma here and I can see the calcium here. It was really primitive, but now I'm sure that the, uh, the technology and research, uh, the project is advancing. So the, I have a question to Dr. Kubo. So I was uh, very surprised to see their data from Wakayama. The uh, only plaques that categorized that lipid rich plaque by OCT had huge ACS events. The five the plaques categorized that the fibrous and the calcific plaque had the huge ACS event. So did the fibrous and the calcific plaque not cause the ACS event regardless of the, the degree of the luminal stenosis? And one more thing that if, uh, if we focus on the OCT-derived syncap fibrotoma, could it be possible to predict the future ACS event? Yes. Uh, so number one, uh, so you asked you me the uh, uh, fibrous plaque or a uh, calcified plaque. So in our data, uh, there is no ACS event uh, from those plaque and those plaques, uh, especially within five years. The baseline OCT plaque characteristics is affected within five years follow-up, but more than five years, uh, the uh, baseline uh, of OCT plaque characteristics is less associated with the event. Okay. But uh, uh, my answer, the fibrous plaque and the calcified plaque was not associated with uh, a follow-up ACS event in our data. And uh, uh, number two, uh, uh, what was the question? Sorry. The, uh, when we look, when we focus on the think of fibrotrauma. Ah, think of, think of fibrotrauma. And uh, uh, so uh, think of fibrotrauma uh, is um, definitely associated with lesion specific ACS events. Uh, but uh, 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 so uh, I would like to say, so fibrous cap thickness is associated with the event. But uh, most of Big issue and important uh, problem of OCT is interpretation. So OCT and uh, uh, interpretation is sometimes different between the interpreted researchers. And uh, to overcome this issue is very important uh, for OCT detection of vulnerable plaque. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can I uh, make comments? Please. So Takashi, when you yes. try to find vulnerable plaque. Why are you doing it? Why? Because uh, you want to do local treatment, right? Uh, yes. So, um... yeah, let me just finish. So several studies showed with a contemporary medical therapy with very aggressive mm -hmm. cholesterol lowering therapy, 70% of plaques do regress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the rest of 30%, 20% will develop so-called stepwise rapid progression, 10% slow linear. Slow linear is not a problem. When they reach a critical threshold, they will develop stable angina due to supply demand imbalance. So 20% of plaque do not respond too well to statin therapy. So you mentioned our study, MGHOCT registry. When we follow TICFA, not just lipid-rich plaque, TICFA. 
only 1% cause non STEMI during four year follow up. Mm -hmm. So, if you are going to provide preemptive treatment of what you call vulnerable plaque, that you think is vulnerable, it may not be vulnerable, mm -hmm. then 99 out of 100 patients will receive unnecessary stent. That's number one point. Number two is, as you know, with widespread use of statin therapy, the pattern of pathogenesis has been changing over the past two, three decades. In other words, plaque rupture was the predominant mechanism 20 years ago, no longer true. You know, panvascular inflammation is now suppressed with the statin. So it is now being reversed. non stemi becomes dominant pathobiology of acute MI. So let's say 50% of erosion, right? So you, if you pursue whatever you want, lipid-rich plaque, TICFA, you know, uh, near, what is it called, whatever, you miss 50% already to start with, right? So when we started OCT 20, 23 years ago, and that was our goal, find the vulnerable plaque and treat it locally. But last 10 years, we have better understanding of pathobiology of acute coronary syndrome. This is a panvascular process. And recently, last five years, we've been focusing on layer plaque. We learned so much. There, as you know, there's a continuous plaque disruption, healing, disruption, healing. If you look at the prevalence of layered plaque in stable angina patient, you find layered plaque at the corporate lesion over 70%, okay? So it may rupture, but vast majority of rupture is subclinical, clinically silent. So if you start treating those lipid-rich plaque, even TICFA, especially in those people with stable angina, our, our thought was they have very robust endogenous antithrombotic mechanism. So their body can suppress total occlusion, thrombotic occlusion. And before your body does its own job, you intervene probably unnecessary stand. I'd like to hear your thought. Yeah, I have a, a, some question to the uh, Minoka, uh, to the uh, uh, Professor it, uh, You always uh, provide a new finding and a new insight uh, based on uh, the uh, OCT. And uh, uh, when you look at the, uh, the patient with angiographic diastenosis diam less than 50 and the mild elevation of the cardiac enzyme, but the, when we follow the that patient was a four-year follow-up. Cardiovascular mortality is about uh, uh, 13%. It's a uh, high. When we uh, more think about that, when the patient have uh, the uh, stent implantation in multiple site, cardiovascular mortality four years later, 13% is uh, reasonable, not high. But the angiographic uh, the severity is uh, less than uh, 50, mild elevation, too much high. What is the, the underlying cause of the cardiovascular mortality? And second one is the, the uh, definition of the minoca. It's a too heterogeneous. A lot of the, the disease entity, not coronary. And so what is the, the main region? We only focus in the, the coronary or itself. So therefore, that is the, the one of the reason why dual antiplate therapy is uh, not the independent uh, risk factor in, in, in the, uh, the analysis. Finally, the, the, uh, what is the, the main symptom in patient with uh, the intra plaque cavity without the communication of the lumen? When we evaluate the lumen, no thrombus, no narrowing, what kind of it the, the, uh, provoke the patient symptom in such kind of cases? Yeah. <laughs> so the Minoka is MI. They have to present with a positive biomarker with ischemic symptom. And as I mentioned briefly during my talk, 
the whole field is so messy, uh, which is good for us. You know, there are so many things that we can do, research opportunities. But right now, what's the etiology? I think it's a combina combination of vascular and endogenous thrombotic or anti-thrombotic mechanism. And the reason why they have such a higher stroke rate is not just simple you know, plaque rupture, right? And also another thing, I have seen a number of cases at Mass General, patient comes in, no obstructive diseases, minimal plaque, but they have ruptured plaque, empty cavity, very small, with the minimal layers of atherosclerosis. So that, that's, that made me think, oh, this is probably some sort of vascular pathology. And emboli is small, as I said, troponin leak is relatively small. So this is different entity, and now heterogeneous group. The whole field is so messy, and interpretation is, is very different depending on who reads it. So we need a lot of work in this field. Very exciting. Before, before wrapping up, um, I think that we should uh, address uh, the very interesting presentation by Gary Mintz. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, we certainly, the main use that we're making of intracoronary imaging at this point is guidance of our procedures. So I would like to ask uh, Yoshi, Yoshi Onuma and uh, Yu Ming An to have uh, their reactions to the different aspects of the discussion of, um, of dissertation of, of, of Gary uh, regarding, for example, the algorithm to um, for strategies in classific plaques, etc. So Joshi, would you like to um, say some comments about this? Yes, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Javier, for the um, pointing me for this, uh, um, to, to have an opportunity to comment on this uh, uh, lecture of the uh, Professor Mintz. So um, I think the, uh, this calcium score is uh, quite practical and uh, useful, and uh, it, it's, it's really oriented to the clinical uh, usage. Um, I have just one comment that maybe there will be also a combined catheter of uh, IBUS and OCT in the near future, like uh, Konavi has one and also Terumo is developing one, so that in the future maybe this kind of the combined catheter might um, solve some issues and a little bit standardize the, how to see the uh, uh, calcification in or the other plaque morphology. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe just I would like to know that what is the uh, um, view of the uh, Gary about the uh, combined catheter and the other uh, comment is that we discuss about the physiology in the first part of the uh, uh, session and uh, how do you see that uh, to combine the um, uh, physiology and uh, intravascular imaging uh, for example there's also the OFR or the kind of the image based uh, uh, physiology like uh, based on the OCT measurement so how do you see that kind of the um, upcoming technology? And uh, do you think that it will also change the practice uh, in the future? Well, um, the combined IVIS OCT catheters are very exciting, but the problem is that neither is state-of-the-art quality. So the OCT is not state-of-the-art OCT. The IVIS is not state-of-the-art IVIS. And so I think the compromises that have been made so far are not acceptable. Give me state of the art one or the other, or even better both, then we're talking. In terms of adding physiology, I think um, I think the you know the OFR is great. You can do the same thing with IVIS if you want, but then you're starting to instrument the coronary arteries. And one of the beauty of moving to angio FFR is you don't have to risk instrumenting the coronary arteries. Um, the point of my talk, Yoshi, was to say, look, IVIS and OCT look different. You have to interpret the different, but the concepts are the same. You know, how we use them to, to optimize PCI is really very similar, and we should not be focusing on differences, but rather the fact that they are more similar than different. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mintz. Uh, this was a very good comment. We have to wrap up um, these uh, two excellent uh, sessions uh, at uh, TCT AP, uh, both on physiology and imaging. I would like first uh, to thank uh, 
the panelists and speakers for their dedication for this uh, excellent discussion and of course to all the attendees uh, to the session thank you very much also to the co-chair uh, dr hong uh, for uh, working with me in chairing this session we wish you a very good day <laughs>